Yes. <laughs> yes, dear. Thank you. <laughs> That's what good couples do, baby. Don't show any bloopers. Hi, I'm Chet Anderson, executive pastor at Calvary Baptist Church, and this is Claudia, my wife. What makes our marriage successful is the fact that we choose on a day-to-day -day basis to communicate clearly that we want to be married, we're going to stay married, and we're going to be open and honest with who we are with each other. I think communication is the key to our successful marriage. Just open, honest communication, discussing uh, issues as they arise in our relationship and just discussing uh, everything, feelings, and everything that's important to us. Mm -hmm. when that all-important communication breaks down, when we get um, hurried and when we get busy and we find ourselves going in two different directions and we don't take that time to be deliberate about our communication, I think that we open ourselves up for possible conflicts. Yeah, I, I would say probably conflict happens most of the time when Chet wants what Chet wants and when he wants <laughs> it and doesn't get it. Um, not clearly communicating uh, my needs or feelings or wants or desires in our relationship. We redeem conflict by what we call 24-hour rule. If you've had conflict, if you've been uh, offended by something, you have 24 hours to bring it up. And if you don't bring it up within that 24 hours, it's finished through and done with. But if there was something important enough for you to address, bring it up, talk about it, have healthy conflict within the 24 hours to resolve. I think for me, um, learning the all-important tool of being able to say, we agree to disagree, mm -hmm. and being safe by saying that, that um, differing opinions really um, don't have to cause conflict. But the 24-hour rule is also good because, you know, 24 hours is done. It's done and it's not, um, you're not able to bring it up again because you've either dealt with it internally or you've dealt with it together, but you've put it away. I would say that I would want couples to know that, he, that marriage is a great opportunity to fulfill God's purpose for life. Um, appreciate the, the family members and each other especially, and appreciate them in such a way that you not only show them with actions, but you're using words that back up the actions, that you love them, that you're proud of them, and that you truly want them, the best for them in, in their life and their marriage. You know, a couple of years ago, Pastor Chad and the staff here at Calvary did a series of sermons on uh, live like you were dying. And one of the points of that sermon, or, or one of the sermons, was to um, keep a short list of wrongs. You know, we're not promised tomorrow. And I think you should use every day that God gives you to make sure that the people that you care about the most, your, your spouse, your family, knows exactly how you feel about them. Um, I know that in our family, we've uh, at times been separated by lots of miles, and I want, always wanted my children to know, no matter how far away they were, how much they were loved and how much we cared about them. And I think just saying it often and uh, making sure that you enjoy every day as if maybe you might not have another one given to you because again, God doesn't promise us tomorrow. So use every day to make sure that all of your family knows exactly how you feel about them. <laughs> well, obviously we're continuing our series called For Better or Worse. This is a, a, a series that is focused on families, on marriages and families. And it, because here at Calvary, we care about your families. We want to see your families uh, thrive. We want to see them be healthy and strong. And so we're investing uh, this series in, in just trying to address some of those issues that uh, every family faces. And, and uh, along with those lines, I know that when we do uh, marriage series or a series like this, that a lot of times uh, it's kind of tough to hear some of the things. Maybe you've been coming and you're sitting there with your little checklist and you go, yeah, I don't do that. Yeah, I don't do that one either. Yeah, I really suck at that. Uh, and that's not the point. 
the, the point is not to, to try and, and expose our flaws because there are no perfect marriages and there are no perfect families. Okay, all of us sin, all of us come short uh, of God's ideal, and we're sharing the ideal. We're talking about this is God's plan. We've already ruined that because of sin, but the more that we strive for that, then the better our homes are going to be. And, and so if you're listening and you're kind of going, yeah, I, I'm not measuring up the way that I want to, uh, guess what? God's grace abounds to you, and, and go ahead and embrace his grace and know that as you move towards his plan, he's going to bless you more. And, and that's really what we're trying to do. Now, as we're talking about this, you know, we're, we've been dealing with the big issues. We've been dealing with commitment and intimacy today, parenting, next week, money. Uh, but I know there's more issues that are out there for families to struggle with. And so here's, here's our request. Our, our two weeks from, from this weekend, we're going to do a series, or a series, we're going to do a sermon that is driven by you guys. Uh, we want to answer your questions about uh, marriage and family issues, whatever they are. So if you'd email those to the, the church office, the information's in your bulletin. We've been asking for these for a couple of weeks. This is going to be the last request. So you got about another week to do that, but uh, I know how good I am at procrastinating. So if, you're, if you've got one, write it down on something, throw it in the offering box, or email it to us quickly, uh, because we want to, uh, to help all of us be healthier and stronger in our in our families. Now that said, I'm going to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12 in your Bibles or on your Bible apps. Hebrews chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Grab one of the pew Bibles that look like this. Turn to page 1,285. Way in the back of the book, you will find Hebrews, and the 12th chapter is what we're going to be looking at. Uh, hey, how many of you have or had parents? Yeah, that's all of us, isn't it? So when you were growing up, what was the most repeated and annoying instruction that your mom or dad gave you? You know, that phrase they used over and over and over again that uh, burned into your soul and you promised yourself you'd never use on your kids, but you might have broken that. Uh, don't tell me. Tell the person sitting next to you. Ready, set, go. Okay, some of you are telling your backstories and your years of therapy that uh, you've had to deal with since uh, that thing. I don't know about you, but for my mom, it was always, if it was a snake, it would have bit you, right? Because I couldn't find anything. Hey, there is no greater blessing or responsibility that God gives us than being parents. Uh, and, and, uh, and if you aren't yet a parent and you want to be one someday, then, then everything we say is going to apply to you as well. And I think every parent wants their child or their children to be happy. Don't you want your kids to be happy? And when, they're, when they're not happy, you're like, what's wrong? I could have fixed this, right? We want our kids to be happy, and we want our kids to be rich. Right? I mean, we want them to be successful, right? We, in some level, you know, play in the you know, National Football League, you know, be on the PGA Tour. If they can't accomplish those things, maybe settle for something less like President of the United States. Uh, you know, we, we want our kids to grow up and become happy, successful adults. So, how, you guys want your kids to be happy, successful adults? Okay, well, good. We all want the same thing. I haven't met a parent yet who really didn't want that, uh, that was engaged at all with their kids. Uh, and you know, that's probably what our parents wanted for us, too. You ever think about that? They, they probably wanted us to be happy and successful adults. And, and, uh, and of course, all of us are happy and successful adults, aren't we? No. No, we're not. The truth is, some of us struggle with depression. And the truth is, some of us have failed repeatedly. Some of us walked away from faith and family for a season. And some of us uh, today are lonely and hurting and struggling. And, and so we rejoice in the responsibility of parenthood. And yet we struggle to accomplish what we hope to give to our kids. And sometimes we wonder, is it possible to raise children who will be happy and successful adults? And the answer is yes, we can. 
And God tells us in His Word principles for how to be godly parents so that we can raise kids who will grow up to be happy and successful adults. If we'll listen to Him. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that He died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then I hope you're ready to hear what God has for us as a follower, as a parent, to hear his principles and to apply them to your life. Now, here's the thing. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ yet, if you take his principles of parenting and apply them to your family, your family will benefit because these principles are universal. You don't have to just be a believer in Jesus and apply them. They work. They work for everyone who applies them. Uh, if you're a follower of Christ, it just makes a lot more sense. So here's uh, my, my goal for this message. My goal is for parents to discuss biblical principles of raising children. My hope is that every couple, when they go home, that you will have a conversation this week. Go on another date night. There's follow up the homework from last week. Go on another date night, and only this time, talk about your, your values. Talk about your parenting. Assess your guys' uh, uh, parenting in light of God's principles so that you can have a discussion because nothing's going to change if you're not intentional about it. If you're a single parent, uh, grab some of your support group, some of those people that you trust that are helping you in that journey of raising your children, and, and, and talk about these principles with them so that you can kind of say, okay, God, how can you help me be what you want? Because God's grace abounds. So uh, let's start off looking at the book of Hebrews. This chapter is really about God's relationship with us. And yet from it, because of his relationship with us as children, we can glean his principles for parenting. Beginning in verse 5 of Hebrews 12, it says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons, as children? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Uh, The first principle that we need to see if we're going to be godly parents is love. Parents love your children. Scripture says, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. God loves us. And, and, and parents, we love our kids, don't we? <laughs> parents, we love our kids, don't we? Yeah. Oh, okay. Man, I thought you were like the weird group of parents uh, for a second there. But see, here's what happens. Because we live in a sinful world, Uh, a world that is broken and twisted by our own rebellion, what happens is we it begins to twist and warp our love, our way of expressing love. And and so we take God's gift of love, and and it it becomes harmful sometimes. For instance, um, let's just use one area that's really obvious. Uh, As parents who love their kids, you want to protect your children, don't you? Yeah, you want to keep them safe. That's part of that, that natural instinct that we have that God gave to us in his image to protect our kids. And yet love kind of, uh, the sin kind of twists that love. And so sometimes we take it a little bit too far, right? Uh, you don't have to confess or anything, but some of, some of you might be those, you know, overprotective, uh, afraid of germs parents, you know, that travel around with a holster filled with like hand sanitizer, you know, and every time your kids touch something like, okay, well, I whip that off, got to clean your hands, got to do this, got to, you know, you guys are the ones hosing down the carts at the grocery store. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you, you know, you just kind of take it to a little bit of extreme. The kids always have to eat healthy snacks, and every time, you don't want them to play in the dirt because you got to wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, you know, for those of us over 40, I mean, we grew up eating dirt, right? 
You know, you, you actually need your children to develop their immune system, and, and they're discovering that overuse of the antibacterial products makes us weaker, not stronger. So, so you know, in our, in our twisted way, uh, we try to love, but we hurt our kids a little bit, and, and sometimes we go way too far, and we, we hurt them a lot. When we try to protect them from failure, when we try to protect them from pain and sorrow, and what ends up happening is we raise spoiled, irresponsible, entitled, annoying adults. And, and remember, our goal was we want our kids to grow up to be happy and successful adults. So we love our kids. So how do we love them the way that God loves us? I'll give you a couple of thoughts. First of all, uh, think long-term gain. Think long-term gain. Uh, sometimes if you want happy, successful 18-year-olds, they got to be unhappy at eight. Okay, that's just reality. Think of it this way. We know that God loves us. God demonstrated his love for us in that he sent Jesus into this world to pay the price for our sins and our rebellion. And so even though we were uh, not living according to God's plan, uh, Jesus took our sins, your sins and my sins, on himself on the cross and died for them so that we could become part of God's family. So we know that God loves us. And, and, uh, and God gives us what we need, not what we want. Uh, we see this in Jesus. You know, uh, he did earthly ministry for three years. And during Jesus' earthly ministry, he fed the hungry. Uh, how many times did he feed the hungry? Twice. He, he took the, the, the small amount of food and multiplied it and fed the multitudes two times in Scripture. Uh, don't you think people were hungry every day? But he just fed them twice. Jesus healed people, but he didn't heal every single person uh, that, that was sick in Palestine during his lifetime. In fact, there's one episode where Jesus is walking through Jerusalem. There's a place called the Pool of Bethesda where all of the sick and lame in Jerusalem would gather. And he healed one guy, a man who'd been lame for 40 years. One guy out of that whole group. He just healed one. Why? Why didn't Jesus do more of that good stuff? Because his mission was to pay the price for our sins so that we could be forgiven and we could live in eternity. So that we could have eternal life. That was the big picture mission. His mission wasn't just to feed people and to heal people for a little while. His mission was to save us from hell. And so he did the, the great thing. He fixed the big problem so that we can endure the little ones until that day of redemption. If you love your children... Let them learn that love says no sometimes. If you love them, let them know that love lives on a budget. Okay? Hey, it's okay to tell your kids, hey, uh, I can't buy that for you because we can't afford it. It's okay to tell them, hey, you know what? I know you want that, but uh, I'm saving up for the Disneyland trip, so you don't get that. See, it's delayed gratification. You teach them that stuff. Teach them that love has boundaries. That please, please teach your kids it's not all about them. That the world doesn't revolve around them. Uh, think long term. And, and by the way, when we're, when we're talking about that, you're capable of thinking long term. Your children, especially if they're little or not, they want stuff immediately. And, and so parents, please don't try to win the moment. Try to win the relationship. Think about what the impact of your actions are going to be when they're 18 and when they, don't, when they have the freedom to ignore you completely. Because you want to build the relationship, not just win that moment. So think long term. If you love them, think long term. And if you love them, well, love leads to Jesus. Love leads to Jesus. You are teaching your children your values, period. That's what parents do. God entrusts them to you, and then you impart your values to them. We warp children in our own image. And uh, it's not what you say to them that matters. What matters is how you live in front of them. So parents, let me ask you a really hard question. Are you valuing Jesus? Are you valuing Jesus? Um, got a little one confessing for mom and dad over there. You know, sometimes that just happens. Okay, if, if you're gracious, you're not looking in that direction trying to figure out who it is right now. And a lot of you are just thanking God that it wasn't your child. <laughs> See, parents, the greatest gift you can give your child 
is an authentic faith that is lived out in front of them. And, and, and that's the, the best gift you can give. So your kids need to see you uh, love your enemies. Your kids need to see you forgive the people who have hurt you. Uh, they need to, to serve joyfully with you. They need to know that you give generously. They need to hear from you that you hope eternally. These are important values that you can't just say, um, believe this. They need to see it lived out from you. So uh, let me just say something that uh, will challenge, maybe even offend some of you. I am all for extracurricular activities. Uh, I mean, I love sports. Uh, I have girls, so I get the whole dance, cheer, gymnastics thing. I played basketball. I played tennis uh, growing up. Uh, but if you value these activities more than you value Christ, it will harm your kids. It will harm your kids. Again, think long term. Uh, your children know your priorities are you leading them to Jesus, or is God just another extracurricular activity that fills your time? Love leads to Jesus. So parents, we need to love our kids like God loved us. And then secondly, parents, please discipline your children. Please discipline your children. Uh, obviously, this entire passage is about discipline, but notice this. It is uh, verse 7, the second verse, second uh, sentence. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all of you have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Uh, there are many theories about discipline. And a lot of them are divisive. And people believe in corporal punishment, timeout, positive reinforcement, and let me just say two things about discipline in the big picture. First of all, abuse is always wrong. Abuse is always wrong. There's no excuses for it. It's just wrong. Secondly, discipline is a lot like modesty. Uh, it's a broad term that is defined culturally, and it is not a one-size-fits-all item. So as you wrestle with this biblical command to discipline, understand that discipline is an expression of love and belonging. Did, did you catch those two, two ideas? That the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and that if there's no discipline in your life, then you're not legitimate. You're not part of the family. You're not valued. And, and so discipline is, is an expression of, of love and belonging, and so we need to establish boundaries with our children. And some of you are kind of going, okay, why? Explain the why. Uh, here's why. It is the parent's responsibility to teach cause and effect. Teach cause and effect. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the world operates on a God-instituted principle that it, it, it is unbreakable. And it's this. You reap what you sow. Okay? If you live any length of time at all, you see this in your life, both good and bad. If you sow weeds in your life, guess what grows in your life? Weeds. If you sow the, the good fruit, what grows? The good fruit. It, it, it just it happens. It's, it's one of those things that is, is part of life, and it's the parent's job to teach their children the, the cause and effect, that you reap what you sow. Because here's the thing. If you don't teach it to them, somebody will. Life will teach that to them, and it's a whole lot better for them to learn it from you because you love them, and it's a whole lot better if they learn it from you when they're young. It's a lot less painful to teach it to them when they're young. They learn it fast, and it influences their whole life. Uh, this is why it's so destructive to protect your child from their consequences. This is why it's damaging to your child if you threaten discipline and you don't follow through. If you want your children to grow up to be successful and happy, then please teach them that they will reap what they sow. And please correct, don't punish. The purpose of discipline is to correct the path. It is to teach the principle. It's to impart wisdom. It is not to inflict pain and demonstrate control. Did you catch that? It's not because you're the parent you get to, to win every battle. Uh, that's why you don't want to discipline out of anger. The idea isn't to punish because your children failed. The idea with, with discipline is to impart wisdom uh, and the understanding that some choices will always result in pain and loss and discomfort. 
Uh, and, and if they're going to become successful adults, they've got to learn this because this is a life lesson. We've all learned the fact that if you make some choices, it's going to hurt. And, and hopefully by now you're old enough to realize it before you make the choice, and hopefully you're wise enough to not to make that choice. But still temptation calls, and we get that. So we're the ones who want to help our kids learn this reality. That's why discipline is so important. Uh, by the way, parents, this is also why you want to give your children freedom as they grow up. <laughs> I was waiting for the teenagers at that point to go, amen. <laughs> you know, uh, you see, uh, here's, here's the temptation. Again, that twisted love says, I got to protect my kids. I got to protect my kids. I got to keep them safe. I, I don't want them to be exposed to any of this bad stuff that's out there. And then they turn 18 and they leave and they fall on their face because they're not prepared. It's your job to teach them how to live as adults. In other words, it's your job to teach them how to become responsible. And the only way they learn how to do that is if you give them enough freedom while they're home so they can fail while they're at home because then you're there to help pick up the pieces and explain to them what happened. You're able to offer godly correction so that they learn from their mistakes so that hopefully when they're out on their own, they will make wiser choices. They will be prepared for the freedom that comes with that. That's your responsibility. That's part of discipline. Um, now, one of the dangers that we face, and I see this in parents, I see the struggle, I understand the struggle, is um, that there are some parents who really are uh, afraid that their children uh, won't like them. I've seen parents who are afraid that their preschoolers won't like them, that their grade schoolers won't like them, uh, that their teenagers, well, that's assumed. But, um, <laughs> and, and I say this in all sincerity, if you're a parent and you really struggle with the need for affirmation from your children, um, please uh, make an appointment to see one of the pastors or counselors here at Calvary this week. We want to help you. And the truth is the only person you need affirmation from is God. Okay, he's the one who will affirm you. He's the one who says, well, jo uh, well done, good and faithful servant. He's the one whose affirmation you need. And, 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 and here's the thing. If you can live knowing that you're raising healthy, successful adults, it's okay for them not to like you for a season. I'll just be honest. Uh, you know, my parents were disciplinarians with a capital D. Okay, I mean, they were tough. I, they were what I call mean parents, all right? And, and, and there were seasons in my childhood where I did not like my parents at all. Loved them, didn't like them. In fact, when I was in junior high, I wanted people to believe that I was an orphan, okay? <laughs> you know, I wanted my parents to drop me off far away. I didn't want to be seen with them. I didn't want anybody to know who they were. That was just reality. Uh, and yet, on the way to church yesterday afternoon uh, for the Saturday night service, I called my mom because I knew what I was preaching on. I said, hey, mom, I want to thank you again for being a mean mom. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, you're welcome. No. Uh, and, and the thing is, I've told her that uh, before because uh, their discipline in our lives helped me and my brothers to become responsible, healthy adults. And if it weren't for some of the lessons that they taught us that I did not want to learn, I wouldn't be the man who I am today. And, and, and so we need, we need that discipline and we need to think long term so that we can grow up to accomplish the goal that we have. So uh, if we want to raise children to be happy, successful adults, they need biblical love, they need discipline, and they need relationship. Relationship. This entire passage in Hebrews is about relationship. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons, as children? Parenting is about relationship. That's so obvious, and yet so often we miss it. Just because you occupy the same house doesn't mean you have a great relationship. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you have a relationship with the living God. That relationship can be a wonderful, close, joy-filled relationship. If so, praise God. That relationship with God can be tense and strained and include lots of correction. If so, repent. Or that relationship could be broken and you're living your life far away from God as a prodigal. It's the same way in your home with your children and hopefully, like our Heavenly Father, you desire that close relationship with your children. So how do we build healthy relationships with our kids? 
Uh, I'm going to share with you just two ideas. Again, there's a biblical parallel with these. Uh, First of all, invest time. You want a healthy relationship with your kids? Invest time. This is the incarnational principle because in Christ, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And, And in the Christmas narratives, it was, you will call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Jesus came to be with us. He he hung out with us. He experienced life with us. He walked with us. So why? Because he wanted the relationship with us. He understands what we face. Um, So parents, talk with your children. Not not at your children, because we do that a lot, right? Go clean your room. Go get ready for dinner. Go do this. Do your chores. Do your homework. You know, we talk at our kids. I'm talking about talk with your children. Uh, You know, be present with your children. And and by present, I don't mean only attending games and and events and and being that chauffeur that drives them there. But play with your kids. Play with your kids. Uh, Which means, parents, you need to turn off the phones, uh, put down the iPad, step away from the video games. I say this as a point of confession because there were a lot of times that my kids wanted my attention and my time, and I was like, just a minute, i got to finish this level, okay? And, and those moments disappear quickly, and you don't get them back. So play with your kids. Build memories. Go places. See things. Explore. They love you. They want a part of you. They don't want the stuff, and I know this is meddling, but look, don't work more so you can buy more toys. Your kids don't want more toys. They want more of you. Now, if they can't get you, they'll take the toys, and they'll make do with it, but that's not what they want. Their deepest level, they want that relationship with you. Invest time in them, and secondly, communicate with them. Communicate with them. Uh, This is prayer. The biblical picture of communication is prayer. Why? Because The God who created the universe wants to talk to you every single day. He he invites you into this relationship where where he can impart wisdom to you and he can hear your your hopes and your dreams and your fears and your failures and he can share life with you. And and that's his desire. And I hope you're taking advantage of that, not only with God, but with your children. As I said before, talk with them. Ask them questions. Not not interrogation questions like, where are you going? And what are you doing? And what are we up to? And and I'm talking about ask them questions. How was your day? I know some of you do that. You pick your kids up, right? I know this. How was your day? Fine. All right, you're the parent. Ask more questions, okay? You know, well, hey, what was good about it? What wasn't good about it? You know, what would you learn? What did did you experience? What funny thing happened? You know, just keep going. Engage them. Listen to their stories and their dreams. Share your stories of when you were a child. And most of all, encourage your children. Bless them. Um, Here's here's the thing, and and, and I'm assuming that most of you as uh, as, as parents want your children to grow up as successful, happy adults, and then you want them to come back and and visit you and like you. Okay, that's kind of an assumption that I'm making. You want your kids to like you when when they're adults. Uh, and, and I'm not saying you need that, but I'm saying you want that. And, and you don't want them to like, come home and move in again, but you would like them to kind of want to be around you. So here's how to do that, and here's how not to do that. Uh, if you want your kids, to, to, as adults, to come home and, and enjoy time with you, then you need to be that wellspring of encouragement in their life. Because the world is going to beat them up. The world is going to tear them down. The world is going to shred them. And if you are that wellspring of encouragement, they're going to come home and drink deeply on a regular basis. That relationship will be healthy in there. If you want your adult children to never come home or you know, to do so reluctantly and cut it short because they have to get back to work or because something comes up, um, then just criticize them all the time. You know, when they're growing up, just tell them how everything is wrong with them and how they don't measure up and how they're a failure. And, you know, judge their friends and their activities and their dreams and, and just go ahead and critique their lives. And when they grow up and get free, they will not be around because they don't need more people piling on, especially the people that they desperately desire to bless them. And, and by the way... Uh, It's never too late to bless your kids. 
If you're listening to me talk about blessing your kids and you're kind of going, wow, I really blew that one. I wish I'd been more encouraging. I wish I'd been more helpful. Then uh, if you're still breathing and your kids are still breathing, then you can reconcile that relationship. You just need to let God uh, get involved in your heart and you need to reach out to them and try these words. I'm sorry. I know I hurt you. Will you forgive me? Because I love you and I'm proud of you and I wish I'd done a better job. Just try that. It's amazing because there are some of you as adults right now who, who would give anything if your mom and dad were able to do that to you. Because you would like to hear those words of apology. You like to hear those words of affirmation. And your kids want to hear it too. So if they're at home in your house, bless them. And if they're already grown, you can bless them. It's never too late. God can redeem. I have story after story after story of people who've come and told me, hey, God healed our relationship, and it's a blessing now. My kids forgave me. Uh, And one more thing on the whole subject of communication. I just have to say this uh, because I hated it when I was a kid. Parents, when your kids ask you why, because I said so is a lazy answer. (laughs) All right? There you go, teenagers. There you got it right there. There's your, there's your uh, conversation point with your parents. No, I mean, they want, they're asking. You can, you can explain. You can take the time. Remember, you're the single greatest influence in their lives. Communicate well. Parenting is God's greatest trust. Are you blessing your children? Uh, every one of us has that choice. And every one of us has failed at some point. And again, if you're listening to this and you're evaluating these principles and you go, uh, I'm not measuring up, God's grace abounds. And and God can redeem. And if you'll invite God to to help you change, he will show up in your family and he will work change. If you need help with that, pastors, counselors, we're we're available. We want to help your, your family succeed. But it boils down to this. Changing your patterns of relating to your kids, to your spouse, to anyone else, it's hard work, but you can do it. I know this because we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you love us and adopt us as sons and daughters because of our faith in Jesus. Thank you for entrusting us with families. And Lord, today I pray that you would teach us how to be godly parents. Teach us how to be godly husbands and wives and moms and dads. Uh, because we want to bless our kids. We want to have families that, that point the way to Jesus. So, Lord, speak into our lives, heal our hurts, and, and give us the faith to take action to change the dynamic in our homes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.